want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the drugs, the magic. Welcome to July 14th, 1997, and welcome to episode 92 of Reliving the War. We have a lot to cover this week. Both shows go at a breakneck speed while they try to cram in as many matches and promos as possible, so it's going to be another episode where we don't really get to sit back and enjoy the matches. It's just one thing after another, which some people prefer, by the way. Raw is live tonight from San Antonio, Texas, while Nitro takes place in Orlando, Florida. Remember to check out the Bash at the Beach 1997 video if you haven't done so already. And if you're all caught up, let's get started. Michael Buffer welcomes fans to Nitro when the Nitro Girls make their WCW debut tonight, led by Kimberly Page. Each dancer gets introduced by Kimberly and they perform a routine in the ring. For those who don't know, the Nitro Girls were used in between matches and promos to keep audience members entertained. Some people like them, others feel their work was an unspeakable crime against humanity. To me, they're just dancers. They didn't take up any airtime that wasn't already used up with filler nonsense anyway. They would get more involved in storylines down the road, and yes, some of that was really bad, but we'll get to all that soon. First up on Raw, we have a Heart Foundation promo, and on Nitro, we have Alex Wright vs. Prince Ikea. So, the hearts are back on American soil and they're getting booed out of the building. Brett says Alberta just resolved its problem with rats, but San Antonio can't say the same. Most of the rats are sitting backstage because they're all afraid of the Heart Foundation. I'm sure Davey has a few of those other rats waiting in the locker room. Mm -hmm. Brett says it's in his contract. If he can't beat The Undertaker at SummerSlam, then he won't wrestle in America ever again. Vince McMahon corrects Brett by saying the contract states Brett has to win the WWF Championship. Championship, and the hitman says Canadians keep their promises and at SummerSlam, The Undertaker will free fall like a dead star. I know, he should have just said The Undertaker hasn't got the jam. And Brett says we're looking at a future five-time WWF Champion. Owen says he and Davey will get their belts back tonight and at SummerSlam, Austin better bring his lip balm because he's gonna kiss Owen's ass. Brett thought this was absolutely brilliant, look at the smile on the hitman. Vince then wants to speak with the bulldog and Pullman's like, oh Jesus God no. Davey says he'll eat a can of dog food if he loses his European title at SummerSlam against Ken Shamrock. Staying off the chin locks has given Davey a lot of confidence. Pillman confirms he's going to wrestle Goldust at SummerSlam, and if he loses, he'll wear a dress the next night on Raw. And Jim Neidhart will shave his beard if any Heart Foundation member loses their match on pay per view. Brett says in Canada, the women are nicer, the money is better, the sports are tougher, the jam is jammier. And Brett then gets interrupted by Steve Austin. A few guys come out to back up Stone Cold and the commentators say one of these guys could be Austin's tag team partner tonight. Ken Shamrock comes out first. The Patriot Del Wilkes then makes his debut by standing next to Austin. Bit of a stupid way to introduce this guy seeing as no casual fans in the arena knew who he was. Psycho Sid comes out folks, I forgot he came back here for this appearance, but you can say goodbye to Sid again after this episode of Raw. And Shawn Michaels comes out too, HBK teaming up with Austin made the most sense, seeing as, you know, he's the tag team champion and all that, but that doesn't happen. HBK's gonna cut a promo a little later on. Fuck yeah baby, get funky like a monkey, das Wunderkind is back with Saturday Night Fever. Oh, big bratwurst. Unfortunately, the Saturday Ride Fever is kept to a minimum this week and so is the action in the ring. Alex was just about to kick the prince's ass in spectacular fashion, but the giant comes out and the big man completely ruins everything. Before this happened, we got to see Alex slapping Ikea and we also saw an actual European uppercut being pulled off by an actual European. About a minute into the match, the giant walked out and he chokeslammed the referee and the prince. 
Alex Wright is way too smart for this nonsense, so he escaped unharmed. What a fucking legend. The giant proceeds to chokeslam every member of security who hits the ring, and among a pile of broken bodies, the giant cuts a promo. He says he's had it up to his throat with the NWO, but the one guy he's now aiming for is Kevin Nash. The giant knows it was Big Sexy under the sting mask at Bash at the Beach, and he knows Nash was the one who hit him with a baseball bat, so Kevin is on the top of the giant's hit list. Doug Dillinger and the boys then come out and the promo ends. Big sexy better watch out, there's a big stinky wart infested giant on the loose. Chavo Guerrero tries to get some revenge on Uncle Eddie next while the Lawlers battle the Putskies on Raw. The WWF give us the next clue in the SummerSlam million dollar giveaway. I don't think they gave us a clue last week or I just completely ignored it, but we see the headbangers playing golf. So our clues are now the key and something to do with the headbangers playing golf? Wait, the headbangers, they're low on the cards right now. The head, the lowest part of the head, it's the chin. The key, it goes in a lock. Chin lock, mystery solved. Polish power Ivan Putski turns back the clock and he wants to sing a song before the match. Love means that I love you so. Bran and Jerry interrupt the song like the villainous bastards they are and Ivan gets sent to the outside. The Lawlers double team Scott but it doesn't take long for Putski Jr to fire back. Jerry accidentally drop kicks Bran while Scott delivers a drop kick to Daddy Lawler. Scott then hits a standard clothesline on Christopher but his second jumping clothesline looked great. Jerry then decided to trip Scott up and some underhanded tactics on the outside leads to the Lawlers taking control of the match. Scott gets hit with everything here, Jerry Lawler even delivers his pile driver. The referee goes to make the three count but young Bran wants to do the honours. So Bran goes up for the leg drop but Scott moves out of the way. Ivan then gets tagged in after Bran hits Jerry with a super kick by accident. Ivan Putski throws windmill punches like an absolute madman and he ends up winning the match with the Polish hammer. This was a fun little attraction match and the crowd absolutely loved it. Take it for what it is and you'll maybe enjoy it. On Nitro, Chavo wants some payback for Eddie leaving him high and dry last week. Eddie thinks it's all a big joke and he slaps his nephew at the beginning of the match. Chavo slaps Eddie right back and Chavo surprises Eddie with a shoulder block. Eddie answers with a tilt the word backbreaker. Chavo continues to catch Eddie out with a few arm drag counters and Eddie gets an insane amount of elevation during a back body drop. The match then goes to the outside where Chavo hits a diving attack and Eddie begs for mercy afterwards. The two get back in the ring and Chavo goes upstairs but he ends up getting his little pelotas smashed on the top turnbuckle. Eddie then hits a superplex, he throws Chavo out of the ring where he proceeds to slap him around and talk a little shit. But Chavo comes back with a few knife edge chops and the fans are getting behind Chavo big time. Chavo pulls off a northern light suplex but he only gets a two count. His follow up German suplex yields the same results and so Chavo decides to go for a frog splash but Eddie gets the knees up. Eddie then hits a frog splash of his own and that's it all over, Eddie wins via pinfall. Eddie hits another frog splash after the match and just as he was going up for one more he gets interrupted by his brother Hector. Eddie ends up pushing Hector to the mat before leaving the ring. Every year, thousands of people succumb to chin lock addiction. While performing chin locks looks like a lot of fun, and it may feel like you're one of the boys when pulling off these devastating rest holds, what you're actually doing is hurting yourself and hurting those who love you. Here at Chin Savers, we want you to kick the habit. We don't want you to be kicking by the habit. So, we've set up a helpline to help you overcome Chinlock Addiction. Not only can we give you advice on what to do when you feel those primal urges to wrap your arms around some poor guy's chin, but we'll also provide you with other moves you could perform instead. You're not alone. Help is only a phone call away. Reclaim your life today and phone 101 Save the Chin and we'll help any way we can. Don't be another victim to chin lock addiction. Call the number and save your life.
We have got Vicious and Delicious against Rick and Scott Steiner next, and we also have Takamichi Noku vs Tajiri Yoshihiro. Before we check out the matches, we have a few quick promos on both shows. Paul Bear says the hell The Undertaker claims to be living in is nothing compared to the life of his little brother. Taker started the fire, he killed his parents, and he turned Kane into a disfigured, revengeful creature. Kane is no longer a child, he eagerly awaits to confront The Undertaker, and next week Paul's gonna prove The Undertaker's little brother is still alive. McMahon also tried to interview Mankind in regards to the remarks he made last week about Mankind and Austin never being the same after this episode of Raw, but Foley doesn't say a word. Tajiri then makes another appearance on Raw, and he's wrestling a light heavyweight match. Takamichi Noku's getting built up as the babyface of the light heavyweight division, and the match both men have here was pretty good. Taka performed this dive to the outside, and he managed to counter a German suplex back in the ring. Incredible timing here from Taka. But Tajiri showed he was no slouch either by performing a sit down powerbomb, followed by an Asai moonsault to the outside. My favourite part of the match though was when both guys just decided to slap the shit out of each other. Taka performs a dropkick from the top rope and he ends it with a Michinoku driver. After the bout, Ken Shamrock says he isn't Stone Cold's tag team partner tonight. He only stood beside Austin earlier on to show he was against the Hart Foundation, and Kenny Boy says he has his own fight tonight against Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Two promos on Nitro before the tag match. DDP comes out and he says he thought Kurt Hennig was a stand up guy, or a jam up guy, even though the Giant and Lex Luger were Dallas's two first choices for a tag team partner at Bash at the Beach. Page says he isn't gonna cry or get mad about Kurt leaving him high and dry last night. DDP doesn't get mad, he gets even. Dallas says he's full of surprises, and if Kurt Hennig doesn't believe him, he should ask Randy Savage about the parka. Harlem Heat then get interviewed, and Booker T says Harlem Heat isn't worried about Vincent or the NWO. Booker says Hall and Nash are going to get whipped tonight like, quote, two sissified punks like they stole something. Stevie Ray says they aren't getting a title shot tonight against the Outsiders, but Harlem Heat are going to turn their match into a good old fashioned street fight. Mean Gene confirms that Harlem Heat vs. The Outsiders is scheduled for Nitro a little later on. Rick and Scott Steiner take on Vicious and Delicious next. Rick and Scott face The Outsiders at Road Wild in August, and the titles will be on the line. This one started off with Buff getting the better of Scotty Steiner, and Buff wanted to show everyone he had a better body than Scott. Scott then got a little payback before showing off his peaks, and this leads to Buff slapping Scott across the face. Bad move, brother, bad move. Bagwell gets his ass kicked by Scotty Steiner and the fans love every moment of it. We cut away to a limousine arriving in the parking lot and Conan steps out. The NWO are right behind him, so it looks like Conan is now officially part of the New World Order. Kevin Nash gets out of the limo and it looks like he's hurt. Back in the ring, Scott Norton gets in on the action. He hits a tornado DDT before tagging Bagwell back in, but it doesn't take long for Norton to get back in the ring where he takes a belly to belly from Scott. The match ends with a run in. Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda hit the ring and Vincent jumps in too. The Steiners still manage to take out 5 NWO guys as the commentators hype up the Outsiders match in Sturgis. Another decent match that's ruined by a DQ finish. Chris Benoit took on Mike Anus next while the Headbangers wrestled Miguel and Jose of Los Bariguas. Not gonna waste time on the Bariguas match, I apologise for any big Los Bariguas fans out there, but this all felt like a giant waste of time to me. It all feels like filler content to pad out Raw's war, and in terms of their matches, along with the DOA, there isn't much to talk about. Perez ended up pinning Thrasher after a powerbomb reversal, and after the bout, the whole Bariquas faction attacked the Headbangers. The DOA then came down to the ring, we had a big old brawl. And just like last week, Savio Vega's squad backed off while the DOA stood in the ring. One thing I'll note here for all you theme music fans, the Bariquas had a new entrance theme and an exit theme. Not too many wrestlers or factions get two themes, but this would also get dropped for the more recognisable Bariquas song. Combined San Antonio, Texas. And it looks like the Marine Clans 
The Patriot says he isn't Steve Austin's partner tonight, but he's in the WWF to go after the Hart Foundation. The Patriot has sat at home and listened to Brad and company rip the USA apart, and that's something the Patriot won't stand for. Nobody will talk bad about America or the American people while the Patriot's around. <laughs> Fuck's sake. I like how the Patriot brought his whole mask collection, even though he isn't booked for Raw tonight. On Nitro, Chris Benoit cuts a split-screen promo saying Kevin Sullivan was a personal problem that Chris took care of last night, and now Benoit is gonna focus on being a horseman. Sullivan is now gone and Chris can focus on beating up guys like Mike Enos here. To his credit, Mike did get in some offense, actually he got in more offense than Chris Benoit. His middle rope fallaway slam looked great. Benoit took a neckbreaker in the middle of the ring too, and this reverse tombstone piledriver looked good, but you just know Enos didn't have a chance of winning here. He applies a bear hug that provided fans with an opportunity to visit the restrooms. Benoit breaks free and Mike hits a power slam. Chris kicks out of the following cover, and Benoit traps the arm before applying the crippler crossface. Just like that, the match is over. Absolute shite. Let's move on. Shawn Michaels is back and he's got a few things to say on Raw, while Nitro takes 10 minutes to squeeze in a Super Kolo vs Leparka match, a Kurt Hennig promo, and an NWO promo. So HBK, where have you been? Have you gotten over Brett pulling your hair out yet? Of course Shawn isn't going to mention the little backstage scuffle he had with Brett, but he's going to run his mouth just as much as he runs away from doing his job. Speaking of doing your job, Vince asks Michaels if he's going to team up with Austin tonight to, you know, defend his tag team championship alongside his tag partner, and Sean says it's up to Austin, it's not up to him. HBK said he sat in his new big house up on the hill and he said he heard Brett say that the hitman wouldn't wrestle again on American soil if he didn't win the WWF championship at SummerSlam. But the problem Sean has with this is the fact that no one invited HBK to attend SummerSlam. Sean says he wants to see The Undertaker run Brett out of the country. HBK gets on his knees in front of Vince. Yeah, he begs for an invite. Sean says he'll set up the ring, he'll sell merchandise, he'll shine Vince's shoes, he'll get on his knees again and suck. Oh, okay then. Yeah, Sean will do anything in order to get that invitation to SummerSlam. Vince McMahon doesn't give us an answer, he lets HBK's music play, and Sean starts dancing in the ring. The fans in attendance. Oh, man, ugh. HBK dances in the ring and he begins removing his clothes. Vince has to stop HBK from doing anything indecent. So, what job will Shawn Michaels have at SummerSlam? We're gonna find out next week, and the promo Shawn delivers in Nova Scotia is absolutely fantastic. Alright, time for a WCW Nitro speed round. Super Kolo vs La Parka, we don't even get a minute of action here. Kimberly stands at the entranceway during La Parka's entrance and she puts up the diamond sign. The commentators wonder if this is actually La Parka or is it DDP under the mask? You can just tell by looking at La Parka though that it ain't DDP and you can also tell by how he wrestles. But Randy Savage doesn't care, the macho man hits the ring and he goes after both Super Kolo and La Parka. Mark Curtis throws the match out, and then DDP shows up and he attacks Savage. Just as Paige was doing some damage, Kurt Hennig shows up, and Dallas gets knocked out with those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks, but we'll call them brass knucks anyway. Savage then hits Paige with the elbow drop, and Dallas is left out cold in the middle of the ring. Mean Gene Okerlund then gets an interview with Kurt, and Kurt says Paige is the biggest mark in all of pro wrestling. Paige used to line up to get Hennig's autograph back in the day, and if Dallas thinks he's gonna come back at Hennig for this attack, Kurt says Dallas won't even last 30 seconds. As a matter of fact, Dallas can't even last 30 seconds with his wife, according to Kurt. Nature boy Ric Flair comes out to greet Kurt, they shake hands, they have a hug. Flair says after Nitro the two can go out and party, but again Hennig doesn't seem too eager to join Slick Rick. Flair still wants Hennig to become a horseman, but maybe Kurt has some other plans. He's just afraid of horseman business guys, just admit it Kurt. Next the NWO came out, Nash is in his ring gear but he's also in a wheelchair. Bischoff says that Kevin is injured and Tony Schiavone says Nash is scared and there's nothing wrong with Big Sexy. Bischoff says that something worse happened to Kevin though, people are accusing him of being the sting imposter at Bash at the Beach and Kevin gets a chance to deny any involvement. Nash says it wasn't him and he had never stooped so low to attack someone from behind. 
Kevin came here tonight though to introduce fans to the newest member of the NWO. Conan proved to the Wolfpack, the NWO and the world that he has what it takes, so Conan gets formally added to the group on this episode of Nitro. Nash is now supposed to team up with Scott Hall to take on Harlem Heat, but the Wolfpack invoke the Freebird rule. Six is gonna step in for Big Sexy. Six and Scott Hall vs Harlem Heat is up next, over on Raw we've got Ken Shamrock vs Jim Neidhart. Before the Raw match, the DOA and the Bariquas have a fight backstage. Los Bariquas are wrecking one of the dirty old assholes bikes, and then the biker Michael Likers show up to get revenge, they have a big fight, and then the Bariquas drive off while towing the bike. The biker goons then follow Los Bariquas, very exciting stuff. Ken Shamrock debuts a new theme tonight also, it's the first version of the theme that we all know, and he's wearing all black too. Jim Neidhart has managed to become the job guy of the Hart Foundation and this match is really no different. Ken shows off his deadly submission skills with sweet armbar transitions, arm drags into arm bars, loads of focused holds aimed at the arm and shoulder. The anvil says fuck that shit and he goes to Old Faithful, two deadly chin locks. You may be able to do all that fancy pants stuff Mr Shamrock but nothing, and I mean nothing, is more physically and emotionally damaging than a chin lock. He gets a bit too confident and he misses an aerial attack. This leads to Shamrock pulling off a nice Frankensteiner and he then locks in a sleeper. Surely Jim won't give up to a sleep. yeah he gave up to a sleeper, Jesus, and look it didn't even put Jim to sleep. Davy Boy Smith's like nah mate not on my watch, Bulldog comes down and Shamrock gets double teamed, Davy and Jim drop Ken across the top rope, Shamrock also takes a spike pile driver, and then the Patriot runs down to the ring to absolutely no reaction and he saves Kenny Boy. Davy and Jim both get hit with the Uncle Slam, you get it Uncle Slam? And yeah, what can you say really, the way they introduced the Patriot was bad, as in they didn't introduce him at all, he just showed up and invited himself to the party. On Nitro then, Six takes Kevin Nash's spot in the tag team match, and he has some instant regret when Booker T lays in the strikes. He comes back with a spin kick and listen closely. Yeah, that's good. Sean said in an interview that Eric Bischoff had some words with him about this after the match. Little Potty Mouth 6 stays on offense briefly but a spin a rooney and a jumping sidekick put Waltman on the mat. Big Nash watches on as Scott Hall and Stevie Ray get tagged in, and Scott also gets some instant regret after throwing the toothpick in Stevie's face. Stevie Ray shows absolutely no mercy. Hall comes back with a middle rope bulldog but Stevie replies with a clothesline. Booker T then gets tagged back in, he takes a fall away slam, Hall tries an arm submission but it gets him absolutely nowhere. Booker T lands a back kick and a running forearm, and Scott has to go to the outside to rethink his strategy, he's getting his ass kicked. Back in the ring the punishment continues, Stevie hits a body slam and he applies a chin lock, Booker T comes back in and he immediately stops Hall from tagging out, it's almost like the NWO are working baby faces tonight. Hall takes a scissors kick and that could have been the match over but he catches Booker with a clothesline. You'd think this would lead to Six getting tagged in but no, Hall stays in there and he takes a super kick from Booker followed by a splash from the top rope. Six ends up running in but Stevie catches Waltman and he gets slammed to the mat, and while the referee's not looking, Kevin Nash jumps up from his wheelchair and he clocks Booker T. Booker T then gets hit with an outsider's edge and Harlem Heat takes a loss. I'm kinda torn about the outcome here, on one hand Six and Hall made Harlem Heat look great by bumping all around the ring but then again, Harlem Heat would have looked even better if they managed to pin Six and Hall. The new Blackjacks take on the Legion of Doom next on Raw, while Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda battle the public enemy. There's a lot of tag matches this week on Reliving the War. Vince McMahon once again tries to interview Mankind but Mick Foley has nothing to say. We see clips of Foley promising that neither he, Stone Cold nor the WWF will ever be the same after this episode of Raw comes to an end, but Mick isn't gonna elaborate for us right now. The million dollar giveaway promo airs again, only there's a bit more to it this time, I jumped the gun earlier on. We are told specifically that this week's clue is life, so scrap chin lock, that isn't the answer. 
the key and life are the two clues that we've got so far and the last one is next week so we've missed one. I went back and watched last week's Raw and they didn't air a million dollar advert on the show but the second clue was actually 2A. So we have the key to a life, the key to a life, absolutely buzzing to hear what clue 4 was. So are you ready to step into Road Warrior World for another tag team match? Well, if you are, get a refund because the match doesn't happen. Pig boys Henry and Phineas attack Hawk and Animal during the entrances. Hawk takes a slop drop that busts the back of his head wide open. And the new Blackjacks fan club gets extremely annoyed and they write angry letters to Vince McMahon. Gonna be honest, I was glad of the run-in. I'm a bit tired of watching tag team matches, but we have one more to look at on Nitro. Chono and Muda vs Public Enemy. It feels like a mismatch, and it is a mismatch. I don't think these guys work well together at all. Grunge thinks he's fucking hilarious by bowing his head to Chono. Chono goes on offense, but Grunge quickly turns it around with a neckbreaker, and again, he bows his head. My sides are splitting. Muda and Rock get tagged in and their exchange is very brief. Rocco hits a running headbutt on Muda and Muda decides he'd rather stand on the apron than wrestle this fucking match. So Chono comes in and Rock ends up hitting a lion salt. Muda gets tagged back in and he's a bit more eager to perform this time. We see the handspring back elbow on Grunge followed by a face crusher. A few kicks keep Muda in control but Rock hits Muda from the apron and this leads to Grunge and Muda making their way to their respective corners to tag out. This has been so so shit. Rocco Rock comes in and he single handedly takes care of Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda, but Vincent ends up being the difference maker, can't believe I'm saying that. Vincent's distraction allows Muda to spray the green mist on Grunge and Chono hits the Yakuza kick. Thank Christ that Chono and Muda won here because it looked like they were going down on more than one occasion. Vincent celebrates afterwards like he just won the match all by himself. Chono and Muda want nothing to do with this leech. Double J Jeff Jarrett takes on Ric Flair next while Flash Funk takes on Vader. Funk and Vader feels like a strange match to put in the semi main spot with neither man having a current storyline and what's more, they wouldn't get one after this match either. Paul Bear brings Vader to the ring and the big man starts off with a few body shots. Funk then gets squashed in the corner and Funk gets brought to the other side of the ring for some of those big Vader forearms. The commentators wonder who Austin's partner will be tonight as Funk slides under Vader before jumping up and kicking him in the dick, I mean Luke, right on the knob. Vader then gets drop kicked out of the ring, Funk hits another drop kick while Vader was beside the apron. Funk then hits a great looking plancha and he continues to bring the pain by throwing Vader into the ring steps. Back in the ring, Flash hits a running kick that brings Vader down. The fans think Funk may have a chance here but he runs into a brick wall called Vader. We then see a power bomb and Vader wins the match. Vader decides to do some extra damage after the final bell. Flash Funk takes a Vader bomb and Vader wants you to tell him right now who the man is. On Nitro, Deborah brings Double J to the ring. It looks like Mongo has lost his wife and really is that a bad thing? Imagine the ridiculous amounts of horseman business that Steve Mongo McMichael can now conduct. The US title is on the line in this match. Flair starts with a side headlock. He ends up taking a backdrop but he comes back with a knife edge chop. Jared gets caught in the corner and he takes another chop for his troubles. Double J hits a clothesline, Flair then gets drop kicked out of the ring. And on the outside, Jared gets thrown into the guardrails while Flair takes a back body drop. No one's getting an advantage here. Jared hits a flying crossbody but Flair rolls through only to get a two count. Rick then does his corner bump and he tries a top rope move. Jared catches Rick with a drop kick. This looked good and Jared knew it too. Jeff then tries and fails to apply the figure 4. Rick hits another hard chop and Jared decides it's time to get serious. His fucking stupid looking straps come down and he takes another chop. The straps coming down did not give Jared superpowers. Flair destroys Double J and the Nature Boy sends a message to Deborah. We see some nation inside the ring and Rick hits a low blow while Deborah talks shit to the camera. Deborah says Mongo is a has been and she's sick of dealing with has beens, and this prompts Big Steve to show up. Mongo tells Deborah to watch. Watch the guy who she backstabbed him for. Rick applies the figure four, Mongo and Benoit get in the ring, and Double J gets absolutely wailed by the horseman. 
Rick doesn't care that he lost his chance at the US title, these guys just want to hurt Double J. Jared escapes the ring and he and Deborah run back up the entranceway. Benoit, Flair and Mongo leave the ring as Benoit says the words horseman style to the camera. We end this week's episode with a Lex Luger promo on Nitro in the WWF Tag Team title match on Raw. Steve Austin cuts a promo before the Raw match, he says he isn't worried about Mankind showing up and as for Shawn Michaels, it doesn't look like Austin wants any help from his former tag team partner, seeing as Shawn isn't at 100%. Steve says he knows what it's like not to be 100% because he's been that way for the past year, but there's no way he's leaving San Antonio tonight without the tag team championships. Everyone's all excited about who Austin's partner will be, but I'm more excited about Davey's excellent, inspirational recovery story. Three weeks chin lock free, and if he makes it through this one, he'll be four weeks completely clean. That's phenomenal. Stone Cold comes to the ring all alone as the commentators wonder what the hell Austin's doing. He keeps both Owen and Bulldog in check, but a spinning wheel kick floors the rattlesnake. Stone Cold gets right back up, he takes a kick to the chest from Owen but he dodges an enziguri attempt and Owen takes a clothesline. Bulldog then breaks up a Steve Austin sharpshooter attempt and this leads to all three men getting in the ring. The odds are seriously stacked against Stone Cold here and it doesn't take long for Stone Cold to get floored. Bulldog gets tagged in, he does some damage while Austin's still on the mat and Davey lays in a few forearms in the corner. Austin replies with a clothesline but once again, the Hart Foundation use their numbers advantage. Stone Cold gets tossed out of the ring and Owen drops the rattlesnake across the guardrail. Check out the bump that Austin takes on the ring steps too, fucking hell. Davey waves the maple leaf inside the ring as Vince McMahon says Austin's partner has arrived. We go backstage where a disco beat plays and someone wearing white boots begins walking towards the ring. Owen hits a belly to belly suplex when we come back from commercial break but Stone Cold stays in the match with a double clothesline. The Hart Foundation then perform a wishbone and Davey stays in the ring. Austin's on the mat, he's in absolute prime position but Davey overcomes his urges and we do not see a chin lock. He just stomps away at Austin's leg and look, he even thought about applying some sort of submission move but he stayed strong and he tagged out. Absolute hero. Owen hits a neck breaker, he puts Austin down with a body slam but then Austin counters a middle rope dive and Owen takes a mud hole stomping in the corner. Austin then gets both Owen and Davey out of the ring and then... Mankind is on the screen but he's wearing tie dye and he's acting very strangely. Foley says he doesn't blame Austin for not tagging up with that mutilated freak Mankind but Austin didn't say anything about not tagging up with the hippest cat in the land Dude Love. Dude Love, the very first character Mick Foley ever dreamed of being in professional wrestling, is coming to save the day. You know what I absolutely love about this? Austin's reactions. I also love the fact that Owen and Davey had a perfect chance to storm the ring and take Austin out, but they too are so fucking confused about what's going on that they just stand on the outside and watch this madness unfold. Out comes Dude Love with his absolutely banging theme song and Austin looks on in complete disbelief. Dude Love gets in the ring, he does a little dance and Austin… <laughs> Clearly Austin's head just completely melted at this sight. What is Mick Foley doing and why is it so awesome? Owen finally attacks Stone Cold and Austin tags in Foley. The tag itself gets a pop and Dude Love goes to work on the IC champion. Owen takes a running knee before tagging in Davey. The Bulldog tries to end it with a running power slam but Foley counters with a mandible claw. Owen's forced to break it up with a missile dropkick. While the referee tries to get Owen out of the ring, Austin runs in and he hits a stunner on Davey. Dude Love covers the Bulldog and Dude Love becomes a tag team champion alongside Steve Austin. Bulldog and Owen leave the ring as Austin and Dude Love celebrate. Dude Love gives his tag team belt to Austin and Foley gets jumped by a few Ric Flair groupies. In the midst of the hot action, Austin gives the belt back to Dude Love and he shakes his hand. A very rare instance of Stone Cold shaking someone's hand and not hitting a stunner afterwards. What a fun feel good ending to WWF Raw this week. People in the audience are laughing, smiling and cheering for Mick Foley as Dude Love dances in the ring just before Raw fades to black. Minji Nokerlin gets an interview with Lex Luger, the total package made Hogan give up last night at the torture rack 
He's been on a roll recently, so let's see what Flexi Lexi has to say about his recent victory. Luger says it's a great feeling to get such a warm reception from the Orlando audience. Lex says he had highs and lows during his career, but last night was one of his finest moments. Lex gets a bit choked up as the crowd begin to cheer. He says the Giant has been a great tag team partner and the two had a great night at Bash at the Beach. Lex loved putting Savage in the rack, he loved putting Hogan in the rack, but it was extra sweet to rack Dennis Rodman. Luger welcomes Rodman to WCW and he says Rodzilla should maybe stick to basketball. Mean Gene says Luger won the Four Corners match back at Spring Stampede. Road Wild is right around the corner and Luger is still owed a WCW title shot. Okerlund thinks August the 9th would be a great date for Lex to go for the title. Luger then formally issues the challenge. He tells Hogan to sign the contract. Hulk's been in the rack too many times, so it's time for Hulk to defend the WCW Championship against the total package. The NWO then show up. The Giant has been sent home, so Lex is an easy target tonight for the New World Order. The NWO surround the ring and then another shit sting comes out. Look at how lame this guy is. I bet it's some jobber like Rocky Ma- Oh, oh, it's the real sting dressed up as a shit sting. Stingception. Nitro then goes off the air. There's no fight, there's no confrontation. Sting and Luger stand in the ring while the NWO wonder what to do. I'm going with Raw again this week. That main event was so much fun and the debut of Dude Love was done to perfection. They knew they had to make it more comedic and a little goofy and Mick Foley absolutely pulled it off. Nitro, Nitro felt a little run of the mill this week and it also felt a little predictable. Raw now has 39 points on our leaderboard, Nitro has 41 points and we've had 12 ties. In the TV ratings, Nitro scored a 3.5, Raw scored a 2.6. Next week, Nitro airs on a Tuesday, but we'll just compare both shows as normal. We've got Kurt Hennig in action in his Nitro debut match, we've got The Great Muda vs The Giant, and we've also got Wrath and Mortis taking on Psychosis and La Parka. On Raw, we're back in Canada. Shawn Michaels makes an announcement regarding the SummerSlam WWF title match that gets the crowd all fired up. Vader takes on Ken Shamrock in the opening contest, and the Heart Foundation compete in a main event flag match. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Reliving the War, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.